the government has to pick its poison, inflation or a complete financial crisis. I think stock markets could be very difficult. Interest rates, I think, are going to continue to rise. Gold has, in an inflationary environment, very much underperformed. I expect inflation to become an even bigger problem. The inflation was a disease of money caused by government. And now they risk hyperinflation and the complete destruction of the, the monetary system. And it's amazing to me that the markets can't see through these self-serving lies. Welcome to the Capital.com Look Ahead for 2023. Today we're debating the state of the global economy, including is a recession unavoidable? What is the future of tech stocks? And is crypto done for? Our guests today are Nigel Farage and Peter Schiff. Nigel Farage, of course, is a staunch Eurosceptic. Some would say that as the former leader of UKIP, he is the man behind Brexit. He's a political commentator, former politician, but for many years worked as a commodities trader. Peter is a financial commentator, radio personality and stockbroker who runs his own radio show, Schiff Radio, which is also published on YouTube. He is the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital and involved in a number of other financial firms. Nigel and Peter are going to be giving their opinions on these key points today. Our two guests today are not connected to Capital.com and any views that they may express are personal to them and do not represent Capital.com, nor should they be taken as advice. First off, we're giving both guests 90 seconds to make their case on whether a global recession is unavoidable in 2023. Nigel, over to you first. Oh, I think things will get worse. Yes, I do. I mean, I'm bearish for 2023. I'm not, I'm not mega bearish. I'm not predicting catastrophe. But I, I've always believed that inflation was a disease of money caused by government. I thought we'd learned all this back in the 80s and 90s, but hey, the next generation always has to relearn what the previous one has. So inflation will stick with us, even if we get some slightly easier gas prices, oil prices by the spring of next year. But inflation, that disease is here to stay. Interest rates will stay relatively high. Uh, relatively compared to the last 15, 20 years. I don't expect big spikes in interest rates, uh, but they're going to pretty much stay, I think, where we are. And the cost of living crisis, consumer confidence, is going to be dented for some very considerable period of time. Now, despite all of these things, normal life does go on. You know, business still operates, people still buy things, people still eat, people still go out for a drink or whatever it is. But I feel bearish... Um, I think stock markets could be very difficult, uh, certainly for the first six, nine months of 2023. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, on the currency markets what happens. Uh, we've had a very, quite a sharp appreciation of US interest rates, which has ramped up the dollar and kind of given a bit more inflation to all the rest of us. And, you know, I also think the one that I've been surprised by is gold. Gold has in an inflationary environment, very much underperformed the expectations of many of us. Um, I think much of that hot money was going into crypto, uh, perhaps not so much right at this moment in time. Um, and I guess there must have been some central bank selling, uh, maybe from Russia or the Ukrainians, or perhaps both. So yes, we are going to be in a recession. Consumer confidence is going to be low. Stock markets, other investments are going to be very difficult. I'm bearish but not, not predicting a crash. Peter, over to you now. You've heard there from Nigel, high inflation, high interest rates and cost of living crisis being the key themes for next year. What is your view on what's to come? I think I'm more bearish than Nigel is. I expect inflation to become an even bigger problem. You know, for years, central banks, uh, the Federal Reserve and the ECB, their goal was to create inflation. They were trying to tell us that the problem was that we didn't have enough inflation and they were going to solve that problem. Well, the problem we have now is unsolvable because we never had too little inflation, but now we have much too much 
And, you know, for years, a lot of the inflation that the central banks were creating under the guise of quantitative easing, which is just a euphemism for inflation, a lot of that money was bidding up asset prices, stock prices, real estate prices, even cryptocurrency prices were going up as a result of all that inflation. Uh, but now the inflation has moved into consumer goods, which is where it always ends up. And in fact, it's been there for a while, but the government's methodology for measuring consumer prices have been deliberately designed to minimize the impact that inflation has on prices. But now prices are rising so fast that even the government's uh, rigged indexes can't hide it anymore. So we're going to continue to see consumer prices rising. Interest rates, I think, are going to continue to rise, particularly on the long end, because interest rates are still too low. Just about every country has an interest rate that is still lower than the inflation rate. That means interest rates are negative in real terms. Despite the fact that the nominal rates have come up, you still have negative real rates. And that is an inflationary monetary policy. As long as you can borrow for lower than the rate of inflation, people will keep on borrowing and keep on spending or buying assets. And that keeps on bidding up prices. What central banks really need to do if they're serious about bringing down inflation is they have to allow interest rates to rise above the inflation rate by a considerable amount. They need to really slow borrowing and spending. And particularly, they have to rein in spending by government. Well, I mean, I completely get the logic of what Peter is saying, that governments have excessively borrowed, governments have excessively created money. And ever since 2008, we've been convincing ourselves, no, it's fine. It won't lead to inflation. And in fact, it led to asset price push, which is now fed in, uh, in the end, to consumables. I get all of that. I also get Peter's logic that to really contain this disease of money, rates need to go up quite a bit. However, my counter argument to Peter would be this, that if you look at the levels of government indebtedness, if you look at the cost of servicing that debt, you know, if you put up, I mean, we in the UK, for example, you know, we're looking at current interest rates of interest repayment next year for 23 being over double what our defence spending is. Now, you start to get to these sort of numbers, and politically, it starts to become embarrassing because you have to admit to the public the extent to which you've been bailing out the economy. And I think the cost of servicing national debt is going to be the inhibitor on rates going up too much. Yeah, that, that is the problem that the central banks created. I've been warning about this problem since the beginning. I knew this day of reckoning was coming, but the politicians didn't want to deal with it. So we kept kicking the can down the road. And now we've arrived at the obvious point in that road where the government has to pick its poison, inflation or a complete financial crisis as debt collapses because it can't be serviced anymore. And I think the politicians are going to go for inflation and that's why the inflation rates are going to sh shoot up from here. But they're not going to be able to contain the long end of the bond market. So they may be able to keep shorter term interest rates under control somewhat because of government borrowing, buying them, central bank buying. But nobody is going to hold 10, 20, 30 year bonds once they realize that inflation is never coming back down. See, right now you still have bond investors confident that the Fed can bring inflation back down or the ECB can bring inflation back down because that's what they're saying. But they're only saying that because they can't admit the truth. And it's amazing to me that the markets can't see through these self-serving lies. But once it becomes obvious to just about everybody that inflation is not only here to stay, but it's going to get worse, uh, then the Fed will and the ECB will lose control of long-term interest rates. Our rates are gonna soar and if the central banks try to stop that from happening, the only way they can do it is by cranking up the printing presses even more. And now they risk hyperinflation and the complete destruction of the, the monetary system.
I'm going to step in here quickly because you've been debating here about um, rates. And I think, Peter, I want to come to you first on this. How high do you think rates have to go in order to slow spending? You were talking there about rates having to go above the level of inflation. Some people are predicting peak rates in the United States at 5 percent, even four and a half percent, which we could see at this December meeting. What are your views on how high our rates going to have to go? Well, back in 1980, to contain inflation, which I think was a smaller problem than what we have now, rates went up to 20%. Uh, so we may have to get that high or higher. If you look in the United States right now, consumer spending, credit card debt, uh, mortgage debt, auto loans are still at record highs. Americans continue to borrow and spend. That You're not gonna reduce inflation if we keep on spending. What we have to do is start saving again to stop inflation, but no one's gonna save. Who's gonna put their money in the bank? Even though rates have gone up, they've barely moved up you know, in a bank account. But even if you buy a treasury and get 4%, inflation is twice that high. Nobody is gonna save when inflation is wiping out the value of their savings. So I just don't see any politically feasible way that they're gonna rein in inflation until there's a real crisis. I think if we get a US dollar crisis and a sovereign debt crisis, then maybe in that type of environment where things are collapsing anyway and you know they're damned if they do and damned if they don't, then maybe they'll do the right thing. But until that point, they, they, they're going to continue to kick the can. Nigel, over to you now. We're actually going to focus on the UK now. And we know that uh, the Bank of England has been a little bit more skeptical of rising interest rates. Um, we've seen Governor Bailey, in fact, suggesting that he's more concerned about over tightening than under tightening, which is a stark contrast to what we've seen with Jerome Powell. How high do you think the interest rates will have to get in the UK? Andrew, out to lunch, Bailey absolutely utterly useless as the boss of the fca i mean utterly useless didn't protect a single investor uh, was never there when you needed him how in god's name boris johnson appointed this man to run the bank of england is completely and utterly beyond me inflation it isn't going to happen don't worry your poor little heads then when it arrives it's transitory please don't worry there's not a problem and then panic what are we going to do um, look Here's the point. You know, logic suggests that in these situations, massive government annual spending deficits need to be eradicated. If anything, you try and turn it round and have a budget that repays the debt. But here's the problem. Welfareism in this country, the big brother state in this country, which, by the way, has massively accelerated through the pandemic and into the gas price emergency, it's a little bit like giving a bone to a dog. You can choose not to give a bone to a dog, and the bone, by the way, is called welfare. But once you've given that bone to the dog, you try and get it back. And, and so politically, cutting spending has become very, very difficult. Uh, even the quasi quartain budget um, you know, didn't really recommend any spending cuts of any kind at all. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, the globalist, is now in charge of the economy. There are no spending cuts. Um, look, I I'm afraid the only way government gets out of its debt problem is to inflate it away. Interest rates may go up a bit, but how can they go up too much? You know, if you start to get to the level where as a percentage of your budget your debt repayment, you know, starts to reach the levels of other major items of expenditure, defence these days being a relatively low one in terms of press and public priority. So look, I just think we're going to get ourselves, we, we, we are going to sink deeper and deeper into debt. And, you know, when David Cameron came to power in 2010, our accumulated national debt was about 750 billion sterling. It's now 2.4 trillion. Um, and there's no sign of it coming down this side of the pond. To really cure it, you've got to cut spending, put up interest rates. That way you dampen down inflation. But politically, at the moment, we don't have a Conservative Party committed to it. We don't have a country that even understands it. So we will go on pretty much as we are. And inflation will be the scourge that stays with us.
Okay, so you both seem to agree there that uh, government spending or government debt is the key issue at the moment. We also have interest rates too low considering the level of inflation. So let's take a look at some of the sectors to watch out for in 2023. Now we'll start off first with the tech sector. Peter, I'll be coming to you because we've seen massive amounts of QE and stimulus during the pandemic. And that's when we saw stock tech stocks peaking um, yes. throughout the year. Will the value of tech stocks ever return to this peak? Well, I think uh, tech valuations peaked in 2021. I think that was really the speculative blow off the end of the mania. And what fueled uh, the, the tech bubble was inflation. I mean, that's where a lot of the money that was created entered the economy through the financial system. But also you have to remember that when interest rates are at zero and money is basically free, when investors are trying to value companies that don't earn much money or don't even earn money at all, and they're expected to earn money in the distant future, those type of companies offer a lot more value when the opportunity cost of money is zero, when the discount rate is nothing. Uh, assets that are going to promise returns far into the future can have a much higher present value. But now that things have turned and that interest rates are moving higher and inflation is moving higher, the value, the present value of a future income stream is greatly diminished. Uh, what investors are going to be looking for in the inflationary rising interest rate environment that is going to dominate the investment landscape for the rest of this decade and probably longer is going to be traditional value oriented investments companies that earn a lot of money, that pay good dividends, and more importantly, the companies that sell the types of products that consumers just have to buy. Even if the price goes up, they're going to keep on buying. They may give up buying other things, uh, but they have to buy certain things. And so resources, food, energy, utilities, uh, tobacco, uh, there are going to be a lot of companies that are going to be able to have pricing power and those are going to uh, uh, deliver returns. Nigel, I'm coming over to you now. We've heard there from Peter about inflation diminishing the value of tech stocks. Uh, I quickly want to bring out a question to you, and that is, do you think that uh, Twitter will collapse in 2023? Let's start with tech. Again, recent history. The dot-com bubble that we saw, some sort of 1999, around, around the turn of the millennium. Uh, remember this. The Nasdaq, and people forget this stuff, the Nasdaq, when the dot-com bubble burst, the Nasdaq fell 84%, right? The index fell 84% and took more than a handful of years to get back to where it was before the beginning. Um, and clearly, tech in 2020 and 2021 was insane, massive valuations on companies, in many cases, that had never made a profit. Tech has had a terrible year. It will have another terrible year next year. Doesn't mean there won't be some companies in that space that will do well, but as a whole, that sector is going to do badly. Now, as for Twitter, I love Musk in a way. He's a huge buccaneering hero. He's promised, in the course of the next few weeks, to release the algorithm that shadow ban people like me. I can't wait to see all of that. My Twitter numbers are now going through the roof again after two years of decline. And look, you know, he calls himself a free, a free speech absolutist, but he's not stupid. He understands there are limits to free speech as any intelligent human being does. But let's be clear, I'd love to get Peter's view on this, but he, the price he's paid for Twitter is just lunacy. I mean, it's one, of the worst, it's one of the worst corporate deals I've ever seen in my lifetime. And when you've got seven and a half thousand staff and you basically tell the world there are a bunch of lazy lefties that spend all day at home. Um, I, I, I Look, I really want Musk to succeed. I, I genuinely do. I just wonder whether he can keep the company together. Um, he is letting back on a huge number of subscribers. He's charging a few dollars a month for the blue tick. Um, he will try to diversify the income stream away from corporate advertising. You know, he might make this work, 
But I think in terms of share price, uh, I don't want to be long on Twitter, even where it is right now. Peter, before we move on very quickly over to you, what is your view on Twitter in 2023? Well, you know, when there were first rumors about Musk buying it, I didn't think he would actually do it because I knew the stock was so overpriced that if he really wanted Twitter, he should have just waited it out and he could have bought it a lot lower. But remember, he sold a lot of Tesla stock for more than double the current price in order to raise the money. So, I mean, what's the difference? Had he held on to the Tesla stock, he'd have lost the money that way. Now, I know he paid a lot of taxes when he uh, actually realized some of those Tesla gains, uh, but given the source of the funds, uh, it's not that big a loss for Musk. And I'm sure he's having a lot of fun doing it. You know, when you're as rich as, rich as Elon Musk is, sometimes you don't do things necessarily because uh, it's financially worth it. Uh, he, at this point, I think he just does what he wants. And if it costs him a few billion dollars, you know, I feel sorry for some of the people that invested alongside him uh, in this venture. But I, I prefer to be a part of Twitter now that Elon Musk owns it. You're either a lover or a hater. You are a, a, a stern supporter of crypto and you believe that they are the future or you're a wild skeptic that will never go anywhere near it. And I think it's a very polarizing debate. And I think um, throughout 2020 and 2021, everyone thought that crypto was the future. It was unstoppable. It was going to new levels. But of course, in recent times, we've seen the demise of crypto. We've seen FTX as well and all the scandal that has created. Um, will crypto make a comeback in the new year? Peter, we'll stick with you on this one first. Well, first of all, not everybody thought crypto was, was the future. Uh, at least not the current iterations of it. These fiat tokens like Bitcoin that are just conjured into existence and have no real value other than, you know, something that you could you could trade and gamble on. Uh, but eventually you run out of fools. It's always been based on the greater fool premise. And I guess there were a lot of fools. So that uh, enriched the fools that got in earlier. Maybe they were smart enough to recognize uh, how many fools there were. I wasn't. I, I I passed on Bitcoin when I first heard about it because I knew it wouldn't work. I just underestimated the number of people who couldn't figure that out and who would buy it. But I think just like the Nasdaq, crypto insanity peaked in 2021. It was the most speculative part of of of, of that you know investment landscape. And we had you know the NFT craze as well and all these pump and dump schemes. You had El Salvador get in there. You had Michael Saylor. Uh, you had uh, um, Anthony Scaramucci at Skybridge. You know, some of these institutions bought into it and started buying into the top. You got all kinds of leverage. And that, that bubble has popped. There's still a lot of air that's going to come out of it. So I think what you're going to see is a big break in all of crypto, not just Bitcoin. There's more uh, things that are going to blow up. Uh, FTX was not the last shoe to drop. You, it's a centipede. There's a lot more coming. There's more uh, scandals, more losses. Uh, you know, unfortunately, what this is going to usher in is a whole new wave of government regulation. And that's the last thing we need is more government. I mean, government is really the reason for this bubble because it was the, the, the Federal Reserve that created the environment that allowed it to develop. Uh, but you know, more of the SEC, you know, I talked about that on my podcast, the New York Stock Exchange started in 1792, and we didn't get the SEC until 1934. It was a mistake. It came in as part of the New Deal. You know, whenever the government creates a problem, the solution is always more government. America was better off without the SEC. We were better off without the Fed. Uh, but unfortunately, now we're going to get even more regulation because of this. Is this going to make the U.S. economy less competitive and it's going to un undermine investment returns for everybody? Okay, so I take it that's a no for the future of <laughs> crypto in 2023. Nigel, over to you. Do you think we'll see the death of crypto next year? Look, um, an unregulated market, um, some real stupidities out there. We're in the crypto winter. Uh, there'll be other bankruptcies. I have little doubt about that. There's no clearinghouse, of course, to back up any of these independent providers. There's no proper exchange as such. However, however, I think there are an ever-growing number of people in the Western world loathing the huge 
advance of government in our, the, the rapacious advancement of government intervention in our lives, uh, the attempt to eradicate cash. I mean, it's happening. It is happening. Harder and harder now to pay for things with cash. Harder and harder to get cash out of the bank. Go into the bank and try and pay some cash over the counter. I mean, you're treated as if you're a drugs lord or a money launderer. And I think a genuine fear of central bank digital currencies. And this is not a conspiracy theory. You know, up to 100 governments in the world have done test, test ideas on running CBDCs. And in the light of that, the biggest attraction of crypto, you know, depending which one it is, but the biggest attraction of, of crypto uh, as a whole is it's the one way you can insulate yourself away from government. And the only way they can actually stop you is by totally taking control of the internet in a way that perhaps, you know, communist China or Iran may do. Are we in a crypto winter? Yes. Are the crises going to get worse? Yes. Is it going to disappear as an investment vehicle? No, I don't believe it is. Okay, yeah, and just I, yes or no answer from both of you. Are we going to see a crypto rally next year? Nigel, well, yes or no? Uh, by the end of the year, crypto will be higher than it is now. Okay, Peter, yes or no well, crypto rally? I think there will be rallies and there will be declines. I think it's going to be lower lows and lower highs. I think a year from now, Bitcoin and just about every other token will be quite a bit lower than they are right now. But I don't think that crypto is going away. I think the future of crypto is gold. I think that the world is going to be looking for a alternative to fiat money, especially as the inflation rates accelerate. And the real beauty of blockchain and the internet is that it makes it so much more efficient to use gold, not only as a store of value, but as a medium of exchange and as a unit of account. And I just got back from Dubai and there are a lot of companies coming out with projects with gold backed crypto, uh, where you have all the benefits of Bitcoin, where you have the divisibility, the portability, the fungibility, where people can opt out of a fiat system and adopt a gold standard, but not have to lug around bars of gold. You can, you, you can keep your gold on your cell phone and I can buy a car with my gold or I can buy a cup of coffee or a pack of chewing gum. It doesn't matter because you could, you could break your gold up into little tiny uh, increments and you can instantaneously and very low cost transact. It's way cheaper than cryptocurrencies. It's a lot cheaper than a Visa or MasterCard or any of these other payment rails. So there is a future for blockchain and crypto, but unfortunately, it's not going to involve Bitcoin. Nigel, you were saying in the introduction that you kind of felt that the performance of gold this year has been slightly underwhelming. A lot of people thought that gold was an, a good inflation hedge, maybe because they're thinking back to the 1970s, um, when in fact, back then it was. Um, but it hasn't performed in the way that many people were expecting this year. It's a non-yielding asset. But uh, I do think looking at 2023, uh, potentially if we get a global recession and we see markets and economies uh, more concerned about global recession rather than high inflation, are we going to see gold shining in the new year, Nigel? Gold is cheap. Simple as gold is cheap. Uh, and given what goes on, and I'm mildly bearish for next year, Peter's much more strongly bearish than me, uh, the more bearish things become, the better the prospects for gold. Uh, the more people begin to understand that inflation is here to stay, the more bullish it is for gold. As for crypto backed by gold, yeah, I've spoken to some really big guys looking at these projects. Um, and yes, that has a future provided when they say the cryptocurrency is backed by gold, that it actually genuinely is. <laughs> and that's one thing we have to make sure of. Gold is cheap. Gold is cheap in uncertain times. And even with interest rates having risen, you know, they're much lower than the rate of inflation. The skill with gold, of course, is what currency do you buy it in? Uh, gold in sterling terms hasn't had that bad a year. Gold in dollar terms has had a pretty rotten one. Gold is cheap. Great. Peter, quickly from you, um, you were mentioning there the link between gold and cryptos. But what do you think is going to be the performance of gold in the new year? I think gold's going higher and Nigel's correct. In fact, in terms of sterling, gold hit an all time record high in 2022. And remember, uh, when the exchequer sold almost all of Britain's gold, 
Uh, the price of gold is now up tenfold in sterling uh, since uh, that uh, horrific uh, blunder was made. And it will go down in history as probably one of the worst mistakes that a central bank has made. But, you know, I think that one of the reasons that we haven't seen a stronger dollar gold price is just because investors are still confident that the Fed is going to succeed in bringing down inflation and they will fight as hard as they need to to win the battle. And so uh, investors are not worried about inflation. They're worried about the inflation fight. They're worried about high, how high rates are going to go to win that fight. And they're, and they're looking at that as being negative for gold and bullish for the dollar. But I think once investors accept reality here, that the Fed cannot raise rates enough to bring down inflation, that it will bring down the economy long before it brings down inflation. And so it will go right back to the printing presses. Investors will start to buy gold because now they're going to fear that not only inflation is here, but it's going to run out of control and it may become hyperinflation. And I think the demand for gold is going to skyrocket. And especially once you no longer have the sideshow with crypto, because I do believe on the margins there were some people who might have bought gold, who bought Bitcoin instead, they thought they were buying digital gold. They ended up buying fool's gold. And so when nobody is buying fool's gold anymore, uh, then a lot more people will buy the real thing. Great. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about geopolitics because 2022 has been characterized characterized by um, the war in Ukraine, um, of course, the doom of recession looming over everyone. Peter, I'm going to stay with you first, and we can talk about specifically the US if you want. Um, what do you think the geopolitical situation looks like in 2023? And do you think that China will come back into the picture? Well, you know, I think, you know, we've made a lot more enemies or maybe emboldened our enemies in 2022. And I think we've created an even greater incentive for the world to divest itself of the U.S. dollar and move off of the dollar standard. And, and, and that's really the secret <coughs> of the U.S. economy. It's our ability to just print money and just export it and use it to buy goods that we didn't produce, that our economy just is not capable of manufacturing. So we live off the industrial might of the rest of the world, and we've conned them into accepting you know, the paper that we just create out of thin air. And I think they're gonna become less reluctant to accept that. And, and so you know, geopolitically, this has major ramifications for the United States and its ability uh, to really impose its will and the degree of force that we have around the world because we won't be able to finance it uh, without the world uh, bearing the burden. And I think this will be a positive development, especially for the emerging economies that really bear a lion's share of this burden. Uh, the countries that produce so much stuff that they don't get to consume because they send that stuff to America and import our inflation instead, I think as the dollar collapses, and you get a lot of these emerging market economies, uh, currencies rising dramatically, that will be a huge benefit uh, to the people living in those countries as their purchasing power and standard of living rises. Uh, the opposite will be happening in the United States. Our purchasing power and our standard of living will be falling. Nigel, over to you now, and let's bring it closer to home for us, um, because you were in a previous debate with us uh, in the month of September, and you were talking about the outlook for the Eurozone and the Euro specifically. Do you still think that the Euro will be one of the hardest hit in the new year? And what are your views for the UK? Yeah, I mean, I think the Eurozone's got real problems. I think the European Union has got real problems. Uh, massive economic divides between North and South of Europe. Massive cultural divides between the East and West of the European Union uh, and no sign of any of that improving. Uh, interestingly, um, a new way right of centre government, a new way right of centre Prime Minister Maloney um, has, has appeared in Italy. Um, and this is worth thinking about. The populist revolt, the evil populists, people like me, um, in 2016 with Brexit and my friend the Donald across the other side of the pond, those big political changes took place during relatively benign economics. But you get a much tougher economic situation and the likelihood of political change and, and, and some more radical politics becomes more likely. So I would say, big picture, uh, to those who think the populist revolt is over, well, it may not have even started 
given what may happen economically in the course of the next couple of years. As for the UK, uh, just, I mean, the most appalling Conservative government, three Prime Ministers, four Chancellors, three Home Secretaries, five Education Secretaries, all of that in 2022, um, a virtual globalist coup bringing down an attempt, albeit mishandled, to introduce lower taxes and free market economics and supply-side reform in the quasi quateng budget, um, a Conservative Party that has now launched a war against small businesses and entrepreneurs, people leaving Britain in bigger numbers than we've seen since the 1970s because they don't want a high tax, high regulatory regime, um, and the Labour Party headed for a stonking election majority next time round. Uh, so uh, disappointment, I think, to say the very least. You know, in, it, in political terms, Brexit was about self-government. That's simple, that's easy. In economic terms, Brexit was illogical unless you put in place significant competitive supply-side reforms, and the Conservatives have totally failed to do that. So we're witnessing the last days of Tory government and the last days probably for a decade or perhaps more. So, Nigel, do you think maybe you've shifted your views on which zone or which area can be the hardest hit um, in the new year? Maybe the UK over the Eurozone or the US? But if you ask me, however bad I think UK politics is, would I believe in the Sterling area or the Euro area? On balance, I still think the Sterling area is stronger. I think Europe is even worse. My frustration is we haven't seized free market competitive supply side benefit. Allow me after my long campaign to be frustrated. <laughs> and Peter, quickly before we finish off this section, I know we've talked to you about the US mainly, but uh, what are your views on Europe? Do you think Europe uh, in general or specific economies, if you want, are worse off than the United States? Yeah, I agree. Europe is a mess. Uh, I think the Eurozone is is probably ha has even bigger problems than than the UK. If probably one of the best things the UK did was was get out of that uh, the Eurozone. But, you know, they're their own worst enemy as well. You know, I met a lot of British expats when I was in Dubai. And uh, these are people that it's a shame that the UK lost them. But it's no accident that corporate income tax is zero. The personal income tax is zero. But, you know, it's not just uh, entrepreneurs who are benefiting from low taxes relocating to uh, Dubai. It's lots of people who are moving to Dubai to take advantage of all the jobs that are being created by all these hardworking entrepreneurs. And so that's what we need. We need more free market capitalism and more personal responsibility. But the, the problem with getting there is that even the conservative or the populist politicians don't want to level with the people who are getting government benefits. Like Nigel said, the dog has the bone. Nobody wants to take it away. Even the people that supposedly represent smaller government won't shrink government. Nobody wants to talk about cutting Medicare, Social Security, even Obamacare now, nobody will cut. Uh, so it, government is gonna keep on spending and we're not gonna be able to solve any of these problems until we rein in government. Just cutting taxes doesn't do anything. It just substitutes inflation for taxation. And in many cases, inflation is an even worse tax particularly on the people that it impacts the most. Okay, well, just to finish off the debate, um, it's hard to imagine a year for the markets that's been worse than the current performance we've seen, other than the dollar, of course. So I just want to come to you both, and Peter, I'll stick with you on this one. What are your thoughts or your views on why to be optimistic on the market next year, if any? Well, I'm optimistic on certain markets. I think the emerging markets to me uh, in general look very cheap. And if I'm right about the dollar beginning a new long-term bear market and ultimately hitting new all-time record lows uh, within the next couple of years, I think emerging markets are gonna do very well. Uh, I think commodities are also gonna be strong. I think we've had a, a bit of a pullback, but I think we're gonna see much higher uh, prices across the board, energy, industrial materials, agriculture. Uh, so uh, investments in those sectors and, and countries that are rich in, in those resources uh, should do well. And I think the countries that have the comparative advantage in economic freedom will do well. Countries that have low government debt, low taxes, uh, minimal regulation, uh, surpluses in trade. Uh, these countries are going to thrive. And I think their stock markets 
uh, will do well. And so I think people who invest in those markets will be rewarded. But I think if you're going to invest looking in the rearview mirror in the type of stocks that worked during the bubble days of 0% interest rates and, you know, where just anything with a ticker went up and people just chased momentum, uh, none of that's going to work. So if you don't recognize uh, that that era is over and you're you, and you're just hoping for these stocks to come back from the grave, uh, you're going to go nowhere. I mean, people have to recognize that they need to cut and run from a lot of these stocks, even if you're down 50, 60, 70 percent in some of these tech stocks. It still makes sense to sell them because you can make those losses back if you invest in the right stocks. You don't have to make the losses back in the same stock where you lost the money. In fact, if you hold and hope in those stocks, you're probably gonna just lose even more. Nigel, to finish off, same question to you, reasons or markets to be optimistic in 2023? You know, the history shows us that even in bear markets, there are certain types of companies that do well. It's called a flight to quality. And it's firms that have been around for some time. It's firms that make products that people buy. It's firms that pay good dividends. And of course, the cheaper prices become the better in percentage terms often those dividends are. And the history of those companies is you reinvest those dividends when stock markets are relatively cheap and they pay very handsome rewards over the course of the next three, five, 10 year period. So the flight to quality, very important. Gold, to me, incredibly cheap. And I think buy gold in dollar terms. I don't think the dollar rally's got that much further to go, uh, particularly against sterling. Um, so they're my tips for the top for 2023. And avoid tech. So I'd, I'd still think we should avoid, for the moment, bonds. Uh, be generally cautious about short-term uh, trades. Uh, you know, this is not a bull market anymore. It's not easy money. Uh, this is much more, to me, we're much more in, 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 in being wise, being cautious, buying and holding. Well, I'm sad to announce that we have unfortunately reached the end of our discussion. Nigel, Peter, thank you both very much for joining me to look ahead at what's to come in the markets in 2023. <clears throat> As stated at the top, our two guests today are not connected to Capital.com and any views they have expressed are their own and are not representative of Capital.com, nor should they be taken as advice. To our viewers, thank you for watching and don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date on all the content we post.